everyone. So I know most of you, and it's exciting to see more than just my intro to psychology class, <laughs> since I forced them to come today. This is, this is during their class time. So um, my presentation is, today, as Dr. Connolly said, is to sleep per chance to dream. This is an area that I'm very, very interested in. I focus a lot of my research, both in my, both in my postdoc and actually in graduate school, on sleep. I think it's really fascinating. I don't know about you, but I love to sleep. Um, and of course, what do our dreams mean? And so those are some of the questions that I'm going to try to answer today. And for those of you who really like this topic, um, who are a freshman or a sophomore and are interested, probably in one year, so in spring of 2017, I'll be teaching a sleep and dreaming course again. I taught it last spring, and it went really well, so I'm hoping to do it again um, in the coming years. So sleep, it's really important. Uh, we sleep about one third of our lives. So that means if you're living 90 years, 32 years of your life are spent sleeping at night. And here are some of the things that people had to say about sleeping. Sleep is that golden chain that ties health and our bodies together. Sleep is the best meditation, according to the Dalai Lama. A dying man needs to die as a sleepy man needs to sleep. And there comes a time where it is wrong as well as useless to resist. Hopefully, you'll be able to resist that urge to sleep in this presentation. But if you did, that would be acceptable, right? Because this is a talk on sleep and dreaming. Uh, Marilyn Monroe said, the nicest thing for me is sleep, and then at least I can dream. And then finally, one of my favorite quotes, but not quite as positive as the rest, is Thomas Edison. Sleep is a criminal waste of time and a heritage from our cave days. He did not believe in sleep. He believed it was a waste, and he'd rather be awake so that he could do more research and develop more wonderful things like the light bulb. So what am I going to do today? I'm going to tell you what actually sleep is. I'm going to talk about what happens when we sleep. How do we actually measure sleep? How do other animals sleep? So I'm going to try to focus also on some other species besides just humans. How does sleep develop? So we're going to talk a little bit about infant sleep, which is the area that I focused on a lot in my research, as well as adult sleep. Why do we sleep? Why do we spend 32 years of our lives actually sleeping? And then for those of you who are interested also in dreaming, we're going to talk about dreaming, talk about what dreaming actually is. And what contributions does our culture make? This is part of the Cultural Affairs Committee lecture series. So I wanted to make sure to tie in culture and talk about how culture actually impacts what we think about, interpret, and how we actually evaluate sleep. So it seems like a lot, but let's get started. So sleeping. When sleeping, are we fully unconscious and dead to the world? Or is there a window to consciousness that is actually open? So these are some of the questions that I want you to think about as we continue with the lecture. So consider, we move around when we sleep. I personally am a very fitful sleeper. Uh, but how do we stop ourselves from actually falling out of the bed? Unless you have. And then if so, I'm, I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, we sometimes also incorporate real world noises into our dreams. So who has been dreaming of something and then our alarm, sadly, goes off to wake us up and that somehow gets incorporated to our dreams. Maybe we were dreaming of participating in war and there was a big bomb that went off and actually the sound of the bomb was actually your alarm clock. Some noises also, especially for first time mothers and even mothers in general and, and fathers for that matter, their own baby's cries will actually wake them up more easily than other sounds like their alarm clock. So how do we learn about sleep and dreams? Well, the first thing we can do is actually to monitor brain activity. There are three major uh, pieces of machinery that you need to use the, to do that. I'm going to talk about one on this slide and a couple more on two different slides. So the first is to use an EEG, so you can actually hook somebody up to an uh, electroencephalogram, which are different electrodes that are actually placed on the head, and that actually actually records the electrical activity in the brain waves that we have at night. And we also can potentially look at muscle movements, right? So how the brain is actually reacting, and also the muscle movements and eye saccades or eye movements that we see are very important for determining sleep. We can also expose the sleeping person to noise and words and then examine the effects they have on brainwave patterns and then when they wake up in the morning, ask them what they actually remember doing. And in other areas, we can wake people up and just see if they're dreaming. That's the most important, when you're talking about dream research, one of the most difficult things to do with dream research is actually to figure out how do we assess it? How does someone know they're dreaming? Well, the only way to do that is to actually wake them up and ask them. But in order to recognize sleep, there are certain behavioral criteria that we all use in the area of sleep research. The first one is behavioral inactivity, right? So as you start getting sleepy, right, you start to slow down a little bit and there's less and less behavior. There's also a characteristic sleep posture. Now what's interesting about this is that how a person sleeps, there's huge individual variation for humans, 
But there's also a lot of variation across different mammalian species that we're going to talk about, as well as some lizards and reptiles. Um, there's also discrete, uh, decreased responsiveness, responsiveness to spe specific types of stimulation. But with, a rap with some moderate stimulation, we can actually re it's reversible. right? It's quickly reversible. We can wake the person up. So these are very specific things that we look for. So let's start talking about some definitions. Right? So one of the reasons we actually talk about sleep is that just like the rest of the cycle of life, sleep has a very specific cycle as well. And that is actually referred to as the circadian rhythm or cycle. Circadian actually stands for for about a day, and this actually for, refers to the body's natural 24-hour cycle that we actually go through. Um, and it's matched to roughly the day-night cycle that we see here in the United States. So what actually changes over this 24-hour period? Well, what we see is we see decreases in body temperature, we see decreases in arousal and energy, and mental sharpness, especially as it gets later and later in the day. And in fact, one of the things I like to talk about when I teach about sleep in my intro to psychology class <laughs> One of the things I mentioned is that one of the dips that we see in circadian rhythmicity happens at what time? 3 p.m. What time is, do I usually teach intro to psych? 3 p.m. And what time is this talk? 3 p.m. Right? So again, that urge to kind of fall asleep matches to what we see with circadian rhythms. You can also know, we also know that there's daily rhythms actually vary from person to person and also by age. So for example, general peaks and alertness, we have an evening peak, we refer to those, and sleep researchers refer to those as owls. Typically your age, so 18 to 24, tend to be the night owls, right? They like to stay up at night, they're kind of at their best, they're doing a ton of work. And then right around 50 years, and maybe some people younger than 50 years, we refer to those people as larks. So these are the morning, you know, the early uh, bird catches the worm. So these are people that are really irritating and very cheerful first thing in the morning, right? And like to get a lot of their work done first thing in the morning. So I already mentioned that we used EEG to actually look at some of these circadian rhythms and to look at sleep. And again, those were the electrodes that we affixed to the brain and look at the electrical brainwave patterns. Two of the other ones that are very important on the next couple of slides, I'm actually going to show you what this actually looks like, is to actually do both an EMG and an EOG. So the EMG is actually looking at muscle tone. Right? We're going to focus a little bit on how muscle tone actually applies to and its characteristics of specific stages of sleep. And there's also the oculogram which talks about eye movements, right? So when, we, when I was at West Virginia University for graduate school, I actually had the opportunity to work in a sleep lab. So we'd actually bring students in and we'd hook them up to all of these crazy, crazy wires. This is what it actually looks like when you're done hooking them up. And we would actually, look, we would actually hook um, up sensors also to their nose, right? Because we wanted to be able to detect their snoring. We would also hook up things to their uh, neck so we could look at muscle tone there as well. We also um, had infrared cameras that could actually detect when their eyes were moving during rapid eye movement sleep. And all of this has to be done in order to be able to tell anything about sleep, to be able to do sleep research. Now, how many people in here would like to guess how easy it is to actually sleep hooked up to all of these wires? How many people think it would be really easy? Not so easy? Yay, just want to make sure people were paying attention, <laughs> right? So it's very not so easy. And in fact, we have what's called a first night effect. So typically when you do sleep research studies, you actually have to do the study for at least more than two nights in a sleep lab. Because that first night is probably not going to be the best data because people are having a hard time actually adjusting to being hooked up to all of these wires. So this is just a similar picture, just shows the different wires that you hook up in different areas to look at different muscle tones and different brainwave activities. So when we talk about sleep, we also talk about sleep stages and sleep cycles. So within sleep, the sleep stages actually for the very distinct patterns of brain waves that we see during different stages of sleep. And there are actually four stages of sleep. But on top of that, you also need to talk about sleep cycles. So sleep cycles actually refer to the patterns that we see of shifting through these different sleep stages throughout the night. And in fact, we actually cycle through these about every 90 minutes. So here's actually an EEG recording of what these actual sleep stages look like. So what we have here are the different brainwave activity. And what you can see is that for each stage, there's actually a very distinct pattern. So up here, you can see when you're awake, there's a lot of pattern going on, both a combination of alpha and beta activity. Here's stage one. So this is when you're kind of starting to yawn a little bit, right? Kind of slowing down your metabolism, get sleepy, kind of getting drowsy, right? Kind of drifting off into sleep. So we see theta activity. Stage two sleep is a little bit deeper, but what you see is as the deeper the sleep gets, so the higher the stage number, stage four is the deepest sleep, right? What we see is we see these waves actually start to spread out, right? And they start to slow down, and we see a very distinct activity. 
But what's most interesting, interdispersed throughout all these is wonderful REM sleep. And REM sleep is very, very important. REM stands for rapid eye movement because that's when we think of when a lot of dreaming actually takes place. And what you can notice here is that the REM sleep brainwave patterns actually look very different from the rest of sleep. And in fact, they look very similar to what we have when we're awake. Okay, we're gonna talk more about that. Here's also another uh, graphical depiction of the different types of sleep stages and how we cycle through them. So we start with stage one, we cycle all the way through, and we go through them every 90 minutes. And what you can see is REM sleep is inserted at different areas and different times of the sleep stages. So what is REM sleep? REM sleep was actually first discovered. It hasn't been that long. The cool thing about sleep research is there's a ton of stuff that's being done because it's a very young field compared to other areas in psychological research. And so it was only in 1953, so not that long ago, when we actually did research to find that dreams occurred during periods of very wild brain activity. And we actually saw rapid eye movement during that time. And so that's why we actually termed it rapid eye movement or REM sleep. So what happens during REM sleep, which is very different from what actually happens during non-REM sleep? So during REM sleep, we actually see that the heart rate rises and breathing becomes more and more rapid, right? Before I told you in non-REM sleep and with the circadian rhythms that the rest of the time it actually dips, right? Our heart rate actually slows and so our breathing as we first fall asleep. We also have what we call sleep paralysis. Remember the beginning of the talk, I actually asked you, well, how many people move around in bed but you never fall out, right? Or how many people actually act out their dreams? right? Hopefully nobody acts out their dreams, right? And this is because of sleep paralysis. So this actually occurs when the brain stem blocks the motor cortex's messages and doesn't allow the body to be able to move. So this is why we actually refer to REM sleep as paradoxical sleep. It's a paradox because even though we're technically sleeping, right, and we are immobile because we have this muscle atonia or sleep paralysis, there's still actually a lot of activity that's going on and a lot of things that are occurring in REM sleep. So <clears throat> what we see is that the length of REM sleep actually increases the longer you are asleep. So let's look at this graph. You can see here, when I first lay down within your second hour of sleep, this orange bar represents the amount of REM sleep that you have. Is this orange bar smaller or larger than we have towards the end of your sleep when you're waking up in the morning? Right, and you're actually getting more REM sleep the longer that you sleep, right? So those bouts are getting longer and longer and longer. And so with age, though, what we also see are more awakenings and less REM sleep. And we're going to talk about how that's either beneficial or not beneficial the older that you get. And this one I like even more because the color kind of stands out to me. So the blue represents the slow wave sleep or what we refer to as non-wave sleep. And the pink actually represents the rapid eye movement or REM sleep. So what you can see here, again, the night goes on, you get more and more REM sleep. But it's not just humans who also sleep. There's other mammalian species, other species of animals that sleep in general. So this was actually something that I had to research because I'm not a biologist or a scientist, natural scientist. And so I had to see, well, how do other animals sleep? So here what I've done is I just uh, looked up some information on Google. Um, I don't recommend that for any of your classes. It's not reliable, right? <laughs> And so what I found is, here's a possum, sleeps about 18 hours, these are all in hours. Bats about 19, moles about eight and a half. We have giraffes, giraffes only sleep about two hours um, a total day, right? Horse about three, seal six, dolphins about 10. And actually what we also see with all of these animals is about 70% of all of their sleep, we believe, right, the research that's been done, we believe is non-REM sleep, right? And that the REM sleep component um, and other species doesn't necessarily look the same or mean the same thing physiologically uh, for other species as compared to human species, right? And so, for example, the giraffe here, because he's only, he or she, <laughs> I'm going to refer to him as a he, uh, he's only sleeping about two hours, he's only probably going to get roughly about 30 minutes or so of REM sleep. Whereas another animal who is sleeping much longer, like the hamster, is probably getting about four to five hours, right? If we go with the same premise about humans. But what do we also notice based on the amount of time these, these animals sleep based on their size? In other words, how does the size of the animal impact the number of hours that they're actually sleeping? John, I saw your hand first. 
Okay, the smaller ones, and that's what we believe, right? There's, there's a lot of theories out there. And so the smaller animals are actually sleeping more than the larger animals. Now, that does not hold true for all. So for example, like the big cats and also domesticated cats and dogs are also sleeping, right, a longer amount of time. So it doesn't ha hold true for all, but for the most part, we think it has to do with energy conservation, right? So the smaller animals are sleeping more than the larger animals. So we refer to these as polyphasic species. Polyphasic means that they are sleeping in more than one bout during the day. For the most part, right, uh, humans were biphasic, right? We sleep at night, wake up during the day, and we sometimes will sleep multiple times, right? We can be polyphasic if we're able to have naps, right? So for baboons, they take about three to four naps a day. Rabbits, it's evenly distributed between light and dark, right? So very similar to humans. Rodents like gerbils and guinea pigs, they have very short sleep periods and sleep multiple times throughout the day. Domesticated cats sleep about 12 to 15 hours. And two of their sleep periods are actually during the night, but most of their sleep periods are during the day. But they turn to being nocturnal animals and a lot more active at night. Dogs, also polyphasic, just like humans. So with, uh, they have a lot more of their sleep at night and they're awake more during the day. Horses, they have about anywhere from 3 to 16 sleep bouts per day. Goats, about zero to, see, uh, zero to six sleep episodes per 12-hour period, so also polyphasic. But what we see is the, with the most vulnerable mammals is they actually tend to have the worst sleep because they wake up more frequently. And the reason it's possibly that they wake up more frequently is they have to remain vigilant to predators, right, to being eaten. So they have to be alert to other environmental changes. So we have some very specific, uh, two of the people or two of the types of animals that I like to focus on that have very interesting sleep patterns are dolphins, whales, and porpoises. So they actually need their brain to be awake, right, at almost all times so they can detect danger and also detect other environmental threats. So what we actually see in dolphins, which is very, and other species were very um, interesting and very different from humans, is they experience what we call uni, uni hemispheric synchronization, which basically means that one half of their brain has a synchronous EEG while the other half has a disynchronous. So in other words, in simpler terms, in layman's terms, one half of their brain is awake, the other half of their brain is actually sleeping. Right? And again, this is actually to protect them from environmental threats. So I, that's what I have pictured here. Right? I assume they're sleeping. I was guessing. Right? When I looked at them, it's that hard to tell. And how, the actual animal, what, how animals actually sleep are also different depending on species. So I was also interested in how animals sleep. So what we have pictured up here, this is actually a possum hanging from a tree. I put it up there because I am, as most people know, from the south. So we have a lot of these. Uh, and this over here is a sloth. And I picked this picture because I thought it was cute. Um, and it looks like a lot of, he's having a lot more fun, right? So bats and sloths actually sleep upside down, hanging by their feet. Um, some, individual, some species will sleep on their belly, their side, their haunches, their back, all different types of positions. And those positions tend to be determined on determined by their anatomy and other environmental pressures. So for example, the type of predator can also determine what their sleep locale is. If they're sleeping in a cave, if they're sleeping in a crevice, a tree, a nest, any of those things, or do they even sleep together in herds? There's a lot of animals that actually sleep together in herds, like giraffes, antelopes, and many other primates, because it's easier to fight off individuals, right, or other animals or predators when you're in a group. And everybody pause to say, ah. Right? Who doesn't like a cute cat sleeping picture? So let's talk about reptiles, my least favorite. I mean, they're a wonderful species, right? Very attractive. Maybe a turtle and a crocodile. So crocodiles and alligators, we think, and this is based on some research um, out there, that the rest activity, their brain waves are very temperature dependent. So their sleep looks a little bit different than that of humans. Lizards and snakes, we think that maybe we've identified some eye movements that look similar to REM sleep, but not so sure. Still remains questionable. And turtles and tortoises, they have EEG spikes that are very similar to and correlate with arousal from sleep that we see in other species. But again, these are all areas of research that are still being done. So now let's get back to the most important, the humans, right? Or my, my area of research, the humans. So with infants, infants get to sleep about 12 to 16 hours per day. Full-term infants, they're usually awake the majority of the day, and then they usually take about one to two naps during the day, depending on um, their feeding schedules and that sort of thing, and they tend to take longer naps, right? So usually adults, we tend to take what we call cat naps, right, 30 to 45 minutes. Babies will do this, but they tend to take longer bouts of naps, anywhere from an hour and a half up to three and a half hours. 
And they're awake at night at least once for feeding, typically multiple times. The younger they are, the more often they wake up at nights for feeding. And we also talk about their sleep a little bit different. So with infant sleep, we actually refer to it as active sleep versus quiet sleep, which is basically just using a different terminology for the same type of sleep. So active sleep is equivalent to REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep in, ad in adults. And non-REM sleep is equivalent to quiet sleep. And what we see is that active sleep, developmentally active sleep, will tend to increase while quiet sleep decreases as the infant gets older. So why is sleep so important? Well, first of all, infants have normative night wakings. And usually by about four to six months, these stop, right? They stop waking up, they stop fussing during the night. And they're able, and the reason they're able to do this is because they're eventually able to learn how to self-soothe. Right? And what's interesting is a lot of research has been done that show that parents actually underestimate the number of night wakings that their baby actually has. So some studies have actually set up cameras to videotape babies sleeping in their homes. Right? And, so you'll ask, and so they ask their parents in the morning, they're like, how many times did your baby actually wake up? Right? And most parents are reporting, oh, my baby only woke up twice because that's when they signaled to me or cried. Right? And I responded by going to pick them up and feed them. And what they were finding on the videotapes is that babies were actually waking up more frequently than that, but because they were able to suck their thumb or maybe grab their blanket or something like that, they were actually able to soothe themselves back to sleep. Now, those individuals who have difficulty self-soothing may require a little bit more parental assistance. So co-sleeping is a big one. Um, co-sleeping is actually very controversial in the area of sleep research, especially infant sleep research. A lot of people feel that co-sleeping may not be a good thing. Why wouldn't co-sleeping be a good thing? do you think? Yes, Danielle, I saw your hand first, Danielle. Dangerous for the child the okay, dangerous for the child if the parent doesn't realize the baby's there. Okay, Ian? Suffocation, potentially SIDS, right, sudden infant death syndrome, things like that. Yes, Nicole? Babies then become too attached to sleeping with their parents and then they're still sleeping with their parents when they're 10 years old, yeah, can happen. Right? And the interesting thing, though, is this isn't true for all cultures. Co-sleeping is definitely something that varies by culture. I remember doing a co-sleeping presentation at a conference in Japan, and there was a gentleman there from the University of Tokyo who argued with me, right? Because I'm like, co-sleeping is bad. We shouldn't be co-sleeping, right? And, there, and he was like, no, co-sleeping is good. He's like, we don't understand why you Americans, right, have to always not co-sleeping. He's like, it's not an uncommon thing in Japan, and they tend to just sleep just as well as anybody else. So it also depends on culture. Putting the infant to bed asleep, that's actually a no-no. You should actually put the baby to bed when they're kind of drowsy but not yet asleep. Because if you put them to bed asleep and they wake up and they realize, hey, I'm not in mom or dad's arms, they start crying and tend to get upset. And then, of course, breastfeeding can also impact. If you're breastfeeding during the night, you're probably going to have to wake up with your baby throughout the night to breastfeed. We also know that babies who are breastfeed tend to wake up more at night than those infants that are formula fed because breast milk is actually easier to digest than formula. And the problem with infant night waking and why we're so focused on it is it's not only important for normal infant development, but it also impacts the parents as well. Now, a lot of the parental research that has been focused in this area has been focused on moms because moms do tend to, because of breastfeeding, be the primary caregiver, at least initially uh, when the infant is still breastfeeding. And so because of that, a lot of research has been done that's shown that infant night waking can actually coupled with maternal fatigue increases the risk right, of depression in moms, or increases them a higher risk of reporting depressive symptomology. So what does co-sleeping actually look like? We're not actually the only species that does this. Here's a koala actually co-sleeping. Uh, here's someone in Moraria, New Zealand, who's actually co-sleeping in the same bed. But they're actually using something to elevate the child. This is actually a napping in the desert. This is an aborigine, right, so they're napping. And here's recliner, recliner co-sleeping. Recliner, recliner co-sleeping can be dangerous, right, this is actually unsafe depending on the type of recliner that you can actually have. Some recliners, as you lay in it for a longer period of time, actually tends to ease back a little bit, right, to the point where you may be flat and the baby may move a little bit, so they actually recommend that you don't co-sleep in a recliner. And there's tons of diversity in co-sleeping. Here's co-bedding and twins, right, not uncommon for twins to want to sleep together. They spent nine months together in the womb, so not uncommon for them to want to share the same space. This one's kind of a little bit maybe hard for you guys to see, but this is actually mixed because what we have here is a crib in the room, but now the baby is actually sleeping with mom. That's not uncommon to have that crib in the room. Mom can go get the baby breastfeed. Maybe the baby falls asleep and mom falls asleep by breastfeeding. Here's what we call within sensory range, right? So this is actually something that can hook onto the side of a bed 
where the mom can actually have, and it's, open, it's basically a little crib that has one side missing. Right? So the mom can actually reach over and grab the baby when necessary for breastfeeding. And then of course, let's not forget about dads. Right? Unfortunately, in this area of research, dads sometimes get left out, but dads are just as likely to co-sleep with their infants and their young children and toddlers just as much as moms. And finally, here's a picture of what we call ventral to ventral mother infant co-sleeping. This is the best way to do it. So the mom is actually in a bed and she's got pillows behind her that raise her to a very specific stable angle and the child is actually laid safely on her chest, right? So this is not quite as dangerous, although it does have a little bit of danger associated with it, as would be the recliner sleeping, co-sleeping. And then I just put these in here because most people, when they get older, they're solitary sleepers, right? So <laughs> I don't know what's going on here, but he looks super comfy, right? Um, this is typically my cat whenever I'm trying to do work at home. She likes to lay on the keyboard. Right? And I just love this one. This is one of my favorite pictures. I also put it in uh, various lectures in child development um, because this is sometimes how I feel at the end of the day. Right? I'm putting up a book and then I just fall asleep. Okay. So we talked about infancy. Let's talk about adolescence. Um, we're likely probably going to see more adolescent patients. Right? Adolescents, they have a lot of issues going on developmentally. Right? They're going through puberty or a huge time of change. We're also seeing an increase in obesity. Um, it's about 37% now of children age 8 to 14 suffer from obesity. That's super, super high. It's the highest it's been in a long time. And of course, with obesity, there's a lot of different things that go along with that. But as we relate to sleep, the most dangerous thing is it can lead to what we call obstructive sleep apnea, or OSA. And that means that they're going to stop actually breathing during the night. Right? So the other thing about adolescence that's very different and distinct compared to other parts of the lifespan when it comes to sleep is we actually see what we refer to as the adolescent sleep phase shift, as well as drug use and some narcolepsy. So I'm going to talk about each one of those in turn. So here's the adolescent sleep phase shift. What this means is, is that their total sleep duration, their need for sleep does not go down. It actually increases. So it goes from needing roughly about eight hours of sleep to about 9.25 hours of sleep each night. But when they actually go to sleep, their sleep, what we call sleep pressure, they actually don't want to go to sleep until later at night. Right, so they're going to bed later, but they're still having to get up early for school. Right, so that causes some issues. So their sleep time decreases, right, seven to eight hours because of sleep and having to go to school, but their sleep need actually goes up. And so with the sleep phase shift, we see this around puberty. It means later sleep onset, earlier wake times. And there's a huge weekday, weekend discrepancy, which is what these graphs actually depict. So you can see between girls and boys, what's interesting is the girls are the black circles. Um, for the girls, they actually go to bed, what, earlier or later than boys? They should go to bed earlier, right? But what both of these graphs, graphs depict is that during the weekend, they're staying up later, going to bed later, sleeping until one or two, right? But during the week, they're still staying up later till midnight or later, but they're having to get up earlier, right? So this is why there's been a huge, there's always a huge discussion. Um, there has been, especially the last five years, about whether or not to shift the start times at high schools for students. In other words, let the high school students go to school later so they can sleep in more and let the younger kids go to school earlier. We've also seen an um, increase, of course, in technology, right? So who in here, when they go to their dorm room and they go to sleep at night, they have their iPad or they have their iPhone with them? And they look, <laughs> every hand, right? They, you look at it before you go to bed. Right, so with technology use, because we can be online 24-7, 365, that means that we're losing out on some sleep. And because we're losing out at sleep, we do more caffeine. Right, who in here also drinks Red Bulls from Deb? I'm pretty sure that, that you individuals keep her in business, right, because she's always selling Red Bulls. And this is because people are self-medicating, trying to keep themselves up because they're staying up late at night. And psychostimulant use is also an issue for both adolescent and college student sleep. So we know that psychostimulants, which is a Schedule II drug, are there to stimulate and keep you awake. And what we've seen is that in college students, the low end is 5%, the high end is about 43%, so anywhere in between, of college-age students actually take psychostimulants to stay awake so they can study. And they do this because they want to concentrate and study, even though there's no empirical evidence to indicate this is actually the case. And of course, when you're taking psychostimulants, right, about 8.5% of adolescents do the same, that's actually impacting how you sleep, right? It's screwing up your sleep cycle. And of course, as adolescents age into adulthood, right, the problems that you have in adulthood just tend to get worse as you get older, 
right? So it can lead to bigger problems later on, sleep apnea, insomnia, narcolepsy, drowsy driving, right? That sort of thing. So I've told you sleep between different species, right? We've also talked about adult sleep. So let's focus a little bit on why do we actually sleep, right? This is a huge question. Why do we sleep? Why do we do it? 32 years, are you kidding me? Right, 32 years we donate to sleeping. So we know that in general it varies from age, right? Younger people sleep more than older individuals. We also know that at individual variation is there as well, right? So some people only need eight hours of sleep to function, some people only need six. And we also know that it differs by culture. And in fact, research shows that North Americans actually sleep less than others and are less than they used to. What do you think I mean by less than we used to? What happened between, oh, I don't know, the 1800s and now that's different? Very good, thank you very much. Lights, right? So with the advent of lights, we've actually had a change in our sleep pattern. So previous historical records actually indicated that before the invention of the light bulb, when we were using candles or just using daylight, that we were actually doing two sleeps. And a lot of historical records will talk about first sleep versus second sleep. So first sleep, individuals would go to bed right as the sun went down, and they'd sleep roughly to about midnight or 1 a.m., They'd wake up for an hour or so, okay, do some things, and they'd go back to sleep and sleep again from two until the sun came up. Then we had the invention of the light bulb, and that just changed everything, right? So now we have shift workers and other things. <laughs> and of course, light is so important when it comes to sleep because it actually helps maintain our sleep patterns. Specifically, there's a lot of different, I mean, I could do a whole another lecture, which I'm not, don't get scared, about the biology of the brain and how it impacts uh, sleep. But for purpose of this presentation, the biggest thing is melatonin, right? And this is why you shouldn't use your phones or have a TV in your bedroom or use your iPads before you go to sleep. Because what we have is that melaton melatonin production, which is a very important hormone that impacts sleep, actually is suppressed when we're exposed to light. And then at nighttime when the sun goes down, our melatonin production increases, which makes us actually want to go to sleep. So if you're playing with your iPad, that's just enough ambient light that it's actually impacting your melatonin production, which can impact your sleep. So why do we sleep? There's a lot of theories. It could be that we begin to feel tired because of the melatonin production, so we go to sleep. It could be that we need to consolidate energy, right, and also form memories. We do it to avoid predators. We do it to restore our body cells, right, it's restorative. We do it to maintain hormonal, uh, hormonal secretions and immune function. We know that a lot of great restorative things happen during sleep. But the ultimate explanation, okay, the one that a lot of people in the sleep field actually go by, is that it sustains our ability to reproduce successfully by helping us maintain good health. So to recap, sleep protects us from our ancestors and predators. It restores or impairs our brain and body. It helps strengthen and builds our memories, and it facilitates creative problem solving. Some people's greatest inventions actually came from a dream, which we're going to talk about next. And it's the time when growth hormones are active. Human growth hormone is actually released during sleep, which helps us to grow. <clears throat> so REM sleep is when most of our dreaming actually occurs, and it's also very, very important. We think that REM sleep is different from the other stages of non-REM sleep because we know that with deprivation experience, Deprivation, if we just deprive rats of REM sleep, not all sleep, but just REM sleep, it leads to them eating more but not losing weight. So in other words, it throws their metabolic function all out of whack. And it also, and within 30 days, death would ensue for this, group of, for this group of rats. We also know that it does a lot of different things that non-REM sleep doesn't. We know that it's involved in, actu in memory consolidation and cognition, oxygenating, distributing specific nutrients to our body and our organs and muscles, and also helps us with metabolic homeostasis. All of this is what REM sleep does for us, not non-REM. And of course, during REM sleep, atonia occurs, so that we're not able to move our muscles. And this is important because this allows us not to be able to act out our dreams, right? And that's also, and you actually sometimes we'll hear in the news, right, about the person who swears that he killed his wife, but he did it while he was sleeping. This is actually, probable because he could have what we call REM behavior sleep disorder, which means that for whatever reason, his sleep paralysis isn't working, right? So he's actually able to act out his dreams. So that's why we love REM sleep. And that's what I'm going to focus on in the last few minutes of the presentation is talking about the human dream world. So what we have depicted here 
is this is actually being chased. Being chased is actually one of the most common themes that individuals have in their dreams. But of course, why you're, why, the reason why you're being chased varies from culture to culture. So dreams, what do they mean? Some individuals believe that real acts are perform, performed elsewhere in time and space. Who in here has ever had a deja vu moment where you're like, wait a minute, haven't I done this before? We think that it relates to dreams, that part of our dream world, even if you can't remember your dreams, some of the reasons why you're having a deja vu moment is because of dreaming. Also, other cultures believe that these are considered channels of communication. Shamans learn how to control events and diseases. There's a lot of referral, obviously, to dreams in the Bible and other um, religious texts. And in some cultures, both spaces, real and imaginary, are consider considered to be real and to be important. And there's actually groups of individuals who dedicate their lives to studying what dreams actually mean for their culture. So we know that a dream takes place in a subjective space, right? We know that dreaming is not really open to conscious experience, so to, so to speak, right? It's another plane of consciousness. And we know that the relationship between these two spaces is not necessarily going to be the same from one culture to another. And what I mean by that is that, for example, Indians, dreams are another way of them to act out in the life space. And one of the examples I found is that having visited the spots in one's dream is just as important as having visited the spot in real life. But no culture tends to confuse dreams with waking reality or fails to realize that they're just dreams. But the actual importance of the dream to the individual and what it means for their culture is what varies from culture to culture. So this is actually one of my favorite Newsweeks. It came from 2004, Sleeping Yay! made the cover of Newsweek. So the mystery of dreams, what they mean, the latest theories and links to sleep and insomnia. We know that they're culturally specific. The content can either be direct or indirect. Do you always dream about yourself? Do you? Most people don't, right? Some people may dream about, I don't know, I like to dream about Bradley Cooper, just joking, right? But I don't always dream about myself. There are other people in the dreams. Um, creativity. Some of the greatest works in literature, supposedly, have been a credit to dreaming. For example, R.L. Stevenson, who wrote Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, claimed that it came to him in a dream. Samuel Taylor uh, Coleridge, he was believed to fall asleep in 1797, and he dreamed the 200 lines of what has been called one of his finest poems, which is Kubla Khan. And it's not just us. People have been talking about dreams since the beginning of time. Dreams were discussed by Greek philosophers, such as Pythagoras, Plato, and Aristotle. Sleeping in, for example, sleeping in certain temples were believed to provide access to specific dreams and cures and special types of knowledge that you could only get by sleeping in those temples. Aristotle actually attributed dreams to what he called residual sensory impressions and went on to say that a person's past presented without controlling emotional senses. In other words, the dreamings were without emotion and therefore more real and more important. We also know that dreams are highly visual. Most humans dream in color. They tend to be very emotional. We see a lot more issues of anxiety and abandonment, but also issues of joy. So we tend to see a lot more negative um, emotions expressed in dreaming than positive. They often will refer to events from previous days or weeks. So it's basically a play-by-play -play of what's going on in your real life. Some background stimuli may be incorporated, right? We talked about at the beginning if you're having a dream and then your alarm goes off or a doorbell. Some of them can be surrealistic and morphing, so the law of physics that apply in the everyday world does not have to apply in the dream world. They also have a lot of symbols and metaphors in them. And there's kind of a little sense of agency or volition. In other words, things tend to happen to us in our dreams that maybe we don't happen to us in real life. So let's talk about different types of dreams. There's lucid dreaming. This is very interesting. So there's a lot of debate about whether this actually happens, right? Because I told you, what's the best way to study dreams? Actually ask people, what did you dream about? Did you dream last night? What was it? Those individuals who believe in lucid dreams believe that the dreamer can actually control the dream and almost play a role. It's almost like participating in a movie in your dreams. Lucid dreamers have control over the direction of the narrative. And some people actually do learn this capacity in order to help with treatment for traumas, right, and having very disturbing nightmares. So in other words, they realize they're in a dream, but they continue to act out their dream in their dreamscape, right, as almost acting in a play. They're also important for nocturnal inspiration. 
The benzene ring was inspired by a dream of a snake biting its tail, according to historical records. The machine sewing needle with a hole near the tip supposedly actually came from a dream of cannibals dancing with notches that had arrows that were towards the top of the spears. The plot, like I've already mentioned, of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Frankenstein, which was Mary Shelley's greatest work, she was actually having a dream of bringing her dead baby back to life, which is how she got supposedly the idea for Frankenstein. And the song yesterday, McCartney, he even said, came in a dream. There's a lot of symbolism in dreaming. Freud believed that there was nothing but symbolism, right? And within that symbolism, for Freud, most of it related to sex, right? He believed that you had to have a professional to be able to help you interpret your dreams. He thought there was two different types of content, latent content and manifest content. The latent content was actually what you couldn't remember and you needed the professional to help you interpret, right? The manifest content are kind of the images that you were able to remember. Isaac believed that it, had, it helped add precision and color. It was very adjective based to your dreams. So for example, you can dream of your mother as a cow or a queen, depending on whether she is um, nurturative to you or authoritative. Now, what's interesting though, is Greeks had a reverse theory of symbolism, which I learned this preparing for this presentation. If you dreamed of sleeping with your mother, according to the Greeks, it actually means that your mother country is about to bestow an exceptional honor on you. It's a little bit reverse from other theories. The most commonly accepted theory, though, of why we actually dream is referred to as the act activation synthesis theory. So this was proposed by Hobson and McCaidley, and basically what it comes down to is that they believed that dreaming is just noise. So our brain is a bunch of electrical activity. Different areas of the brain are active at night. And because we're trying to, it gets activated at night, certain parts of the brain are actually active at night, like the limbic system, like the amygdala, right? And basically our brain is just trying to make sense of all this noise. And it does that by creating this narrative, right, a storyline that is a dream. And so if the amygdala becomes activated, that's where fear may be attached to the dream. But in other words, it's just noise and really doesn't mean anything. There's the cybergenetic, or cybernetic, excuse me, theory. This is the idea that dreams are just kind of a byproduct kind of an offline brain sorting daytime experiences. And basically, in other words, we're like a computer up here. So basically, we're discharging, discarding the junk that we don't need to remember, storing the junk that we do need to remember, and putting them into suitable files. And it's these files that we actually dream of. And this actually would help account for the reasons why we have difficulty in remembering our dreams. And that they themselves are just consolidation processes. There's a continuity the theory. The continuity theory just means that the dream is just a continuation of what's happening in real life. And that's why there's so many parallels between what's going on in your actual thought process in the day and what's going on in your dreams. So they believe the bizarre nature of dreams has just been exaggerated. And these theorists believe that less than 10% of dreams are improbable. And that 70% of the time, it's just normal everyday activities. In fact, Domhnoff, which is, one of the more, which is one of the big wigs in this area, in 2011 talked about how dreams are just arising from specific areas of the brain that are activated and are just kind of a continuation of what we see during the day. So in the, during the day when you daydream, right, he believes that's basically what dreaming is. And he actually called this the waking default network. And that dreaming is just a continuation of this at night. There's also the idea of threat simulation. How many people believe there's something under their bed? or did when you were little. Yeah, monsters under the bed. We believe that nightmares may actually reflect anxiety that's associated with life trauma. And there's an evolutionary, what we call threat simulation theory. In other words, nightmares have evolutionary value and it's actually allowing us to act out uh, ways to divert threat. Okay, so we're actually able to rehearsal for coping with real life danger. And 80% of our dreams actually include threatening narratives, right? So a lot of us are having nightmares, or at least threatening dreams. But it's a good thing, right? It's helping us act out um, the solutions to the problem. Another uh, significant area of research in dreams is looking at dreams after 9-11. And what was found here is that dreams that occurred after 9-11 weren't actually exact replays of what occurred. And then in fact, there wasn't more an increase in content of airplanes or towers coming down. But what we saw is that the images of the dream occur were emotionally more intense than before the attack. 
but that the emotional charge was there, but the agenda just changed. So in other words, people weren't dreaming of 9-11. They were just having more negative dreams after 9-11, but it was still more personal to them. Right? It had nothing to do with 9-11, but more about them. And then finally, sleep paralysis. So I told you at the very beginning of this section of the presentation that being chased right, is one of the most common themes that we actually dream about. The other one is an evil presence. Right, a ghost or an incubus. This is why this is actually one of my favorite paintings. This is from Fusilli, and it's, at, it's called The Nightmare. Right, so you have a horse head, and you have what's supposed to be a demon or an incubus actually sitting on your chest. And the ghost or incubus is there because they're actually pressing down upon our body. And another is being able to run away from something in pursuit, right, being chased. And we think this is related to your sleep paralysis that we talked about at the beginning. And that because this is occurring at the fringe of our waking and REM sleep, it seems very real. Right, because we can't move and because we can't get away. Right? It's, bio, it's a residual biological effect. And this actually, a lot of people talk about how this may account for, some people talk about alien abductions or astral projections or all these crazy things that are happening. And it could be that it's actually not happening in reality. It's just happening in the dream world and as a function of the sleep paralysis. So finally, where is the culture in sleep? So I've talked about sleeping, talked about the differences across species, talked about some different theories about related to dreaming. So now the last part of it, the last few minutes, is just going to be where's culture? Since this is part of the cultural affairs series. And all I have to do is ask you a bunch of questions. What do you sleep? In what room do you sleep in? Why do you sleep? Where do you sleep? With whom do you sleep? When do you sleep? What clothing do you sleep in? Where do you, what do you do before you go to sleep? Is there rituals? Is there prayers? All of these questions, at the heart of them, the answers to them are all based on culture. These are all going to be determined by culture. If you go back to the co-sleeping example, us not co-sleeping here in the United States is very different from the co-sleeping patterns that we see in Japan. So where we see co-sleeping as something weird, they don't. We also see differences in napping and culture. So um, I found this quote in an article by Broughton and Dingus, and this is what it said. Although sleep may be judged as a necessary part of sleep, napping has often been considered deviant, an unwanted form of sleep, indicative of laziness, senility, immaturity, and irresponsibility. However, we do know that there are some cultures that participate in the siesta. Right? It's a universal behavior that is, tends to be devalued in industrialized countries like North America because we associate it with laziness, right? Never get caught napping, right? And if you do it, do it in a way that they think that you're working, right? So in the end, sleep and dreaming, one third of our lives are spent doing it. And there's endless possibilities and endless theories about why we sleep and dream. So if someone to say, okay, in one word, which I know seems really crazy because you've just seen this talk and everybody knows I tend to be long-winded, right? In one word, if I could, or let's give me three. Can I have three words? In three words, how would you sum up, or why do we sleep, or why do we dream? My answer is going to be, I don't know. Because everything I've shown to you today are just theories and just ideas. But the importance of sleep, we know it's universal, but the importance of sleep and the value you place on sleep and dreaming is up to the individual. Thank you. <laughs> So the last few minutes are to be reserved for questions. Does anybody have any questions? This is just like, oh, I was going to say this is just like in class, but Jonathan saved me. Jonathan, Dr. Malmune. Yeah, um, what happens when sleep is interrupted, say, two hours, So he's asking what happens when sleep is interrupted. So there's a whole area of research within sleep research looking at the difference between sleep deprivation versus sleep fragmentation. Yeah, sleep so, deprivation. Right, so sleep deprivation is we deprive you of sleep for a couple hours, but you're still getting to sleep. Right? Sleep fragmentation is where you're sleeping in small bouts, like new time moms. And actually sleep fragmentation is worse for you than just overall sleep deprivation. Because sleep fragmentation, where you're, you're not getting to cycle through, Right? Especially, or you're not getting to cycle through a number of times, right? So I told you that you cycle through all of your stages of sleep every 90 minutes. 
So if you're waking up two every two hours, you've gotten through one cycle, but you just started the next one before you wake up. And so it's actually a bad thing. It's worse for you than sleep deprivation. A lot of nasty things associated with it. Yes, Dean Ireland. Ton have been done. In fact, in my sleep and dreaming class last year, students had to do class leads, and there was one group of students that presented on this about sleep positions. At ton, right? So people sleep on their side, their backs, the fetal position, spread across the bed, spread eagle. Um, and as far as is one position better than another, it depends, right? So for example, pregnant women can't sleep on your stomach or really your back. You kind of have to sleep on your slide, especially as you get towards the end of the pregnancy. Um, you know, for some individuals who suffer from sleep apnea, they actually recommend you don't sleep on your back, right? That you actually also sleep on your side, because when you sleep on your back and you suffer from sleep apnea, you probably also tend to have weight issues. So that means all your weight is pressing up on your esophagus. Now, as far as what position is best, I think it's individual variation, and there has been no studies that I'm aware of that has looked at sleep position in relation to what type of dreams or how many dreams that you have. Yes, Megan. Those are actually called uh, tonic jerks, right? Muscle tonic jerks. And the reason individuals actually have them is because it's just random, um, random neuronal firing. Right? And it typically happens in non-REM sleep, especially as you are falling asleep. So what you'll see if you ever watch a video of a baby, for example, falling asleep, initially they're going to be tossing and turning and doing really huge body movements. But then as they fall into REM sleep, you'll only see like maybe like a little muscle spasm. But it's just kind of a sporadic thing, and it tends to only happen in earlier stages of sleep and not later stages of sleep. Yes, John. Right. We, yes, and we call those K complexes, and that's what, and that is indicative of typically somebody is jerking or tossing at that point. Yep. Anybody else? Mike? Any studies done about uh, pre-industrial societies versus industrial societies or rural societies versus urban as far as sleeping? So a lot of it, the pre-industrial versus industrialization, um, a lot of it coincides with the light bulb. Right? That's what I was talking about with the first and second sleep. As far as rural communities versus city communities, rural communities actually sleep better than individuals in the city. Why is that? Ambient noise, right? light pollution, that sort of thing. So if you do research with individuals, for example, individuals who live in a city, if you ask them how they sleep, usually individuals that sleep in a city have to have, you know, apparently a noise maker, right, a noise cancellator. It's not unheard of for them to have earplugs and eye masks, right, if they live on a busy street or they live somewhere where the, you know, the uh, lights are really bright. So they, rural, people in rural areas tend to sleep better than individuals who sleep in a city. Oh, yes, Jonathan, and then gentleman who I do not know, but I know you've been videotaping. Jonathan. <laughs> So there are sleeping patterns individuals in Alaska, yes, they're, they're shift workers. The problem is, evolutionary speaking, humans have been designed to be awake during the day and sleep at night. That's just how we were programmed, right? That's our adaptation to the environment. So we live in an environment that is not conducive to that. It does cause issues and it causes a lot of individual variation in how individuals sleep. Uh, I haven't read a lot of research on Alaska or in Zealand, New Zealand, other places where they have more exposure to sunshine. Um, I do know that's an issue for shift workers. So when you're trying to flip-flop your night and day, so there's individuals who work third shift or swing shift, there's a ton of research and a lot of funding to be had in that area because of the fact that we know it's not good. Those individuals tend to have higher rates of metabolic syndrome, things like diabetes. Um, they tend to also have more difficult problems 
staying awake on the job. So I would think that those individuals, I don't know though, because they've lived there for a while, right? They may be acclimated to it, but it definitely can cause some issues. That's why jet lag, jet lag is such a pain, right? When you go through time, I mean, even just the, sh the small shifts we see as we progress from the East Coast to the West Coast cause such a problem. Yes? Ah. So his question is, remembering dreams, not remembering dreams? I don't know. <laughs> the long and the short of it is we don't know. I'm, I'm an individual, I can't remember my dreams. I just don't. Um, sometimes I do, if I'm really stressed or if I'm sick, sometimes I'll remember dreams. But most of the time I do, or I just remember images. Whereas other people can be able to like get up and be like, let me tell you about the dream I had, it's a 10 minute movie. Right? So it's a lot of individual variation. Um, whether there's certain areas of their brains, of the individual's brains who can remember their dreams versus those who don't. I'm not aware if that research has been done. If, I'm sure maybe it has been. And I would think that would be the, my best guess, right, is that maybe there's something about what their neuronal firing is like versus the individual who can't remember the dream. And I also think it has to do with whatever you're going through in your, in your daily life. Yes, John. Oh, wow. Well, there you go, guys. If you want to remember your, uh, remember your dreams, please eat a lot of spinach. Yes? How does how do diseases like uh, PTSD affect dreams? So with post-traumatic stress disorder, he was asking about PTSD and how that impacts dreams. With individuals who suffer from a trauma, they tend to have a lot of nightmares or their dreams tend to be very high in emotional content. Um, and so they, and so because of that, you know, who wants you to, if you know you're going to have a nightmare or a bad dream, and you know that it's probably gonna be associated with reliving uh, a particular time in your life that you would like to forget, then they tend not to sleep as well, or they tend to avoid sleep. At least that's my experience. Uh, Dr. Schoenfeld, who does, research, uh, does clinic work with PTSD victims, would probably know more. Um, but they tend to just not want to sleep, so you have an increase in insomnia um, in individuals who have PTSD, and you also have an increase in nightmares. They have a lot more negative, in, negative nightmares than other individuals, and tend to have a lot more fragmented sleep. Dr. Schoenfeld. And there's also just the persistent arousal that can be part of PTSD. Right. Also hyper arousal, hyper aware, yep, absolutely. Any other questions? Could we all offer our thanks to Dr. Barry. Thank you. Thank you.